In this lecture, I am going to tell you a little bit about Hebrews, and this is a fascinating letter that I think you will find incredibly interesting. So the first uh, kind of interesting thing about this letter is that the author is unknown. And uh, over the years, scholars have thrown out several options of uh, who the author could be. But at this point, there's not really one person that uh, most scholars agree upon as being the author. Um, with that said, we do know uh, some, some things about the author. Um, the recipients seem to know who it was that was writing this letter to them. Uh, it's included in chapter 13, verse 23, that the author knew Timothy, um, as in Paul's trusted companion, Timothy. Uh, we also know that the author was a very skilled Hellenistic writer, uh, so he was very skilled in the Greek language. He also knew the Old Testament very well. So Hebrews is very Jewish in nature, and uh, so the author was very steeped in, in uh, knowledge of the Old Testament. Um, he also, interestingly, always quoted the Greek Septuagint. So the original language of the Old Testament is Hebrew, but there is a Greek Old Testament um, that it would have been translated from Hebrew to Greek, um, which is known as the Septuagint. And uh, the author of Hebrews, rather than quoting uh, the Hebrew text, he always quoted the Greek text. Um, and then finally, he was a creative theologian that um, set out to uh, study and show the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. And uh, so you'll see, and we'll get into this, that Hebrews is very much a work of art in terms of uh, the writing and the language um, and the style that this author uses. So then we know that this author is writing to Jewish Christians either in Rome or in Jerusalem. And a wide variety of dates have been thrown out there, but it seems that the best evidence points to a date sometime between 67 and 70 AD. So the reason for writing, uh, primarily it was because Jewish Christians were um, under persecution and were facing a lot of pressure that was causing them to kind of drift back into Jewish practices. Um, it seemed easier to revert back to old ways rather than to um, stick with Christianity and endure these, uh, endure persecution and the trials of life. And uh, what we know about the community is that they, they were well established. They were not a, uh, a very new church or new community. Um, they had been well established, but they were still immature. They still needed to be growing. And uh, so the author is calling the church or this community here to stand firm in the faith of Christianity. And he sets out to show how Christianity is superior to Judaism and how it would be an absolute disaster to revert back to their old ways. So then some really powerful key themes throughout the entire letter are Jesus' superiority and sacrifice. So the author is very set on showing how Jesus and his ministry are better. And um, he, he details through very good argument um, how Jesus is better than many things, appealing back to the Old Testament, um, appealing to these um, important images or icons within Judaism, and is then showing how Jesus is better. Um, and then he talks a lot about the new covenant and how through Jesus, the old covenant has been fulfilled and the new covenant is now here and is, uh, you know, should be embraced and should be uh, the, the, uh, the, the people of the church should embrace this and live it out as members of the new covenant. And then finally, the author also uh, highlights the humanity of Christ. He wants to show in great detail that Jesus was actually human and this was necessary in order for him to atone for the sins of humankind. So the structure is interesting because it progresses back and forth between a theological argument and then practical exhortation. 
So what's important here is that the author wants to show that you can only get to the application or the practical exhortation if you understand the, uh, the theological underpinnings. And so he is showing a clear picture of how um, the early church needs to be developed and built upon strong doctrine. It doesn't just skip straight to practical exhortation and ways of living, but the way that one lives should very much be rooted in the theology of Christianity. You can't have uh, one without the other. And so he shows this um, over and over throughout the book. So then going back to the key themes, the theological arguments that he, uh, that he shows are he wants to point to the completeness of Jesus, that Jesus has come and is, uh, is the only needed thing for those. The, the people need to trust in Jesus and he is the only thing they need um, to be part of this new kingdom and part of the new covenant. And then uh, he also shows the completeness of the new covenant compared to the old and how the new covenant um, was, the old covenant was preparing the way for the new. And now that Jesus is here, there's no reason to look back and go back to old ways. So then looking at the practical exhortations rooted in that theology, um, the author encourages the readers to faithfulness, to continue in um, the faith of Christianity. And he gives several warnings about those that fall away and those that end up rejecting Christ. And uh, the warnings get more and more severe as they go on throughout the book. Uh, he wants to make it very clear that uh, one should not fall away or should not walk away, that there is good reason to believe in who Jesus was and what he had done. And so to fall away would be a grave mistake. Uh, he uses the language of let us or therefore several times. So therefore being kind of a connector between the theology and then the exhortation. So, um, you know, he makes a theological statement and then says, therefore, or because of this, let us do this. And uh, he gives several statements about, um, about these exhortations. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast to our confession. Let us leave behind elementary doctrine. Let us consider how to stir one another up. Let us lay aside every weight and run with endurance. Um, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that can't pass away. Let us offer acceptable worship. Let us continually offer up sacrifice of praise. So he very much gives um, practical instructions for how to live that are rooted in, uh, in theology. And then just a couple of interesting facts, and I already touched on this, that Hebrews is a letter, but it reads very much like a sermon or essay due to its great literary style and structure. And then the other is uh, Hebrews 11, which is kind of known as like the great hall of fame of faith. Um, the chapter is filled with uh, a list of famous believers throughout scripture who persevered in the face of uh, persecution or hardship or trials. And um, it's just a continuation of this theme of a call to continue in the faith. So once again, I think that Hebrews is a great letter. And I think that if you approach it with an open mind, you will love reading this letter.